Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, World Trade Under New Management. This is uh, part, this is the April event, um, or the March event, actually, of our State of Trade webinar series, which is a monthly series of experts offering timely insights into the rapidly changing world of international trade. Before we get into our substance and our excellent guests, let me start with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you can see multiple application widgets that you can use. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. You will be able to find a copy of today's slide left using our guest shortly, but as a bit of foreshadowing, included in the same section, you'll find a link to Bernard Hochman's book, Trade in the 21st Century, Back to the Past, and two of his recent articles, WTO Reform Priorities Post-COVID-19 and WTO Reform as a Triangular Problem Among China, the EU, and the US. Please also join us April 7th for Logistics Rewired, How to Manage Up When Freight Constraints Rise, uh, our other webinar series, and you find a link to that on the top right. We invite you to ask questions through the Q&A widget on the right. We will try to answer as many of those as we can during the webinar, time permitting. We also invite you to share with us other webinar topics that you'd like to explore or any comments you might have about the program. We're trying to share valuable insights. It helps to know what you think is valuable. So a quick survey for that is on the bottom right. And lastly, an on-demand version of the webinar will be available shortly after our conclusion, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. All right. The part that makes the lawyers happy, please keep in mind that all information provided in this webinar is presented based on the situation at the time and may not be customized to your specific situation. All right, what have we got for you today? Um, we've got some excellent guests. I'm Phil Levy, I'm Chief Economist at Flexport, and joining us we have Kelly Ann Shaw, who is a partner at Hogan Levels, a, a major law firm, non-resident senior advisor at CSIS, and an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School. Previously, she was Deputy Assistant to President Trump for International Economic Affairs and Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, and she's done extensive work on U.S. international trade, investment, economic law, and policy through public service that has included stints at the White House, the Office of the U.S. Trade Rep, and the Ways and Means Committee in the U.S. Congress. Kellyanne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward. And we also are very pleased to have Bernard Hochman, who is Professor and Director of Global Economics at the European University Institute. He's joining us from Florence. Um, and he is at the, also at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, um, he is, where he is the Dean of External Relations. He is a Center for Economic Policy Research Research Fellow um, and has researched for decades on international trade, international economic cooperation, and on trade agreements. So, Bernard, thank you very much for uh, for calling across the pond. Glad to be with you. All right, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about world trade under new management, and this is to give you a preview of what we'll be talking about. We are um, focusing on the rules that ostensibly govern the global trading system, uh, and those are brought together under the World Trade Organization. I say ostensibly because lots of other things have been happening We'll go through that. It's in the news because we have a new director general, uh, Dr. Ngozi okonjo um, and we'll talk about what that means, what is the job, and then we'll focus on some of the specific issues that have been at the core of debates about the WTO. How are disputes resolved? Is it still a good forum for negotiations? And where are we heading with all of this? So that's our plan, as is our tradition here. We're going to start by getting you all involved, our audience, and I'm going to ask a question, which is to get a feeling of how you think of the World Trade Organization and the gap that preceded it. So this is a poll question. Get ready to register your opinions. Um, here are your choices. So the World Trade Organization and the gap before it were, one possibility is, a good idea when created after World War II, but that era has passed. Alternatively, problematic from the start perhaps because of an infringement upon sovereignty. Another possibility is fine until China joined. Another possibility, useful. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with them. The system just needs a little tune up. Or lastly, they were always a mystery to me. Tell me more. So 
If I can ask you to register your opinion, let me know what you think, um, vote, and then we'll show everybody the results and launch into our discussion. So I see some votes coming in. Thank you for, uh, for people who have already registered. Um, this is your chance. Be heard. Um, there are no wrong answers. So uh, this is a contentious topic. So let me give a moment or two more. Thank you. We're doing well. And then we will see what the survey says. Okay, going once, going twice, results. All right, so we've got a lot of curiosity um, that it's, it's sometimes hard to know what these organizations do. That's great, you came to the right place. Um, and then a fair bit of optimism that they're sort of fundamentally wrong, the system needs a little tune up um, with smaller groups thinking fine until China joined or problematic from the start. Um, with, with sort of in between there, the good idea. All right, great. Thank you very much for doing that. We'll be coming back with a couple of other polls as we go. But for the, the, the plurality who said, tell me more, you've got it. That's where we're coming in. Actually, we'll address all of these things. Um, I want to talk a little bit. We're going to start out with what is the current state of the WTO? Um, and I will first offer a little history um, while I'm dominating the microphone here and then uh, use that as a, a sort of platform to kick things off with our, with our guests. So, so once upon a time, once upon a time, you had economic shocks, you had countries that responded by slapping tariffs on each other, thinking that in doing so, they could move demand from imported goods to their own domestically produced goods. And the result was, and they mostly retaliated against each other when they did this, and the result was something of a mess. If we're going to take this as the origin story of the GATT and the WTO, that time was the 1930s, that the U.S. did the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, um, you had a breakdown of the global trading system, and while I don't think the evidence is there that this was a cause of the Great Depression, it certainly didn't help. And it was seen as part of the general economic malaise of the 1930s. And when countries were trying to rebuild the global economic system more generally after World War II, one of the one of the, the forces there was how do they unwind those damaging tariffs? How do they reach mutually beneficial bargains that would let everyone sort of back away from this this bad outcome where they had found themselves? All right, and so what you see here on this table is uh, a bit of the history of how that worked. Nobody needs there won't be any quizzes. Nobody needs to memorize anything about this. Here's the point. A couple of things to note. The way this worked was not that anyone sort of legislated. These were a series of meetings that were referred to as rounds, where countries would get together and say, what kind of deals can we strike? So you see that the first round there was the Geneva round in 1947. Note also a relatively small number of countries. It was 23 countries that got together. This was not the whole world. And even that, I would argue, is a little bit misleading that you had sort of major countries um, that a subset of those that played a more dominant role, and that was true for these rounds. What I don't have on this chart is what they covered. Essentially, for about the first five of these, they covered tariffs. It was all sort of tariff reductions. How do you get tariffs down? And the deals were very much, you cut your tariffs, I cut my tariffs. Um, and they would do this for each other. One of the things that's striking when you look at this is in the year column, you can see duration. So. Initially, these were fairly frequent and they were fairly brief that they would strike a deal. They'd come back in a couple more years and strike another deal. And this, this happened with a degree of rapidity. So it was not a free trade organization in the sense that you had to practice free trade if you joined it. Countries did maintain tariffs. There were some issues that either started out off limits or ended up off limits, agriculture, started out more included and then got excluded a bit. Um, but you ended up with, with things building. Now, if you look over time, as you get towards the bottom of that table, the one of the things you note is that these single year rounds all of a sudden became multi-year rounds. So you had the Kennedy round lasting for several years, the Tokyo round lasting for about six years, and the Uruguay round lasting for about eight years. Um, as a historical note, it was during the negotiation, the Uruguay round, that I first met Bernard. We were both um, in Geneva during some of these negotiations working for the GATT. One other sort of historical sidelight on this, 
that when this was done, there had been a thought, we should really have an organization to oversee global trade, because we know it's a big deal. They were going to have something called the International Trade Organization. The International Trade Organization never really got off the ground, in very large part because of U.S. opposition by the time this came around. And so that's why you have this bizarre thing where this was all referred to as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, because... They couldn't, that was supposed to be an interim thing where we'll have an agreement and then we'll have an institution. The institution actually did not show up until the very end of the Uruguay round. That as you had had, also had the number of issues expand. And so instead of just talking tariffs, you were talking about things like subsidies, about large passenger aircraft, about, um, sanitary and phytosanitary regulation. And you would have various codes that were off in different pieces attached to this general agreement on tariffs and trade. That was all supposed to come together um, at the end of the Uruguay round where you had this shiny new creation, the World Trade Organization. Note also that as we did this, look at the expanding number of countries. That by the time you were talking about the Uruguay round, you had 123 countries. Um, then you get to Doha, which launched in 2001. All of a sudden, things didn't go so well. We could argue it hasn't really completed. Uh, one last point I was going to make. I'll come back to the sort of timing of this. I said this was not a pure free trade organization. So what was it? What were sort of core principles? What was at the heart of all this stuff? You had a few. One was this idea of most favored nation status which sounds like it's the nation you most like to hug in the evening. Um, that's not what it meant. Uh, and so people kind of rebranded that as normal trading relations. The, the way to think about that is this was a way where you could take bilateral discussions and have a multilateral trading system. So if I was having a trade negotiation with Bernard and then separately I was going to have one with Kellyanne, Bernard would need to know that I could not undercut my promises to him. If I offered him a 10% tariff, but then I offered Kellyanne a 5% tariff, he, he wouldn't have gotten the concession he thought he had gotten. Therefore, most favored nations simply said, whoever was treated the best, in that example, Kellyanne, everybody would get the same treatment. You would get the same treatment as the most favored nation. Even that was kind of honored in the breach because there were pre preferential trade agreements, things like the European community um, that they could be nicer to each other. Other basic core principles, non-discrimination, that you treat like products the same once they pass customs, that you can't tax them differently, for example. And one that's contentious that I think we may want to come back to a bit, which is how are developing countries treated? And then I noticed the expanding agenda. All right. Um, I want to, I'll put my timeline back up and Kellyanne, I want to kick this to you to start us off on this. When we got to the end of the Uruguay round, like I said, you, you had this new world trade organization. It was supposed to have a near, you know, legislative function where you could solve problems, um, you know, get back to those old every other year kind of things, take on the new issues that were popping up, things like electronic commerce. Um, you were going to have a dispute settlement mechanism that was really effective. And this was going to be where people really had worked out their issues what went wrong? Yeah, it's um, it, it's a great question, and I, I really appreciate that you set that out in historical context. I, I spent 10 years as a U.S. trade negotiator, including three years in Geneva, where I got these posters of Mont Blanc and um, enjoyed my weekend skiing. But, I, you know, I, I certainly have a lot of views about about the WTO, what went wrong and, and how we could potentially fix it. But, you know, just looking back historically, which I think is the right place to start, you know, it, it is very remarkable what was achieved over the near 100 years of the, the organization history starting with the GATT and going into the WTO. In the post-World War II era, average tariff rates globally were somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. Now in the WTO context, the average tariff rate among WTO members is more like 9 percent. So we've come a long way in tariffs and we've also come a long way in terms of the scope of what the organization uh, uh, seeks to cover. So in addition to tariffs where we largely started throughout the last century, we now include a number of non-tariff bearer issues, provisions on services, on intellectual property, 
property. Um, there were provisions on a, a GATT reform in the WTO agreements and so on and so forth. So we're, we're looking at a broader scope of commitment. But it is possible that we just got to the level of, you know, we made sufficient progress and you know there might be more that we can do, uh, but it's good enough. And there seems to be a couple of things happening with the WTO. So number one, um, negotiations have not progressed much further beyond 1995. And so while in the decades leading up to the creation of the WTO, we were able to make successive progress, since then there has been no multilateral market access negotiations that have been successful. There has been this last box called the Doha Round, which went on for a number of years, um, trying to take on a, a whole host of issues, and it just stalled out for a variety of reasons. Um, so on the negotiating side, it, it stalled. Um, on the monitoring side, um, countries have stopped reporting into the WTO on what they are doing in terms of their subsidies, in terms of what's happening in their economy. Um, so there isn't a realistic picture of what's going on within WTO members. And there's now, this chart says 157, I think there's now 164 members globally who are part of uh, this organization. And then yeah. the third interesting dynamic that's happened is um, the dispute settlement system. So you have all of these new commitments that were made um, that you have 164 countries signed up to abide by. Now, where there's a disagreement, they can enter into consultations with one another. Um, if that's not successful, they can then request that a panel hear the arguments on both sides, kind of like in a court um, where both sides are making pleadings, they're making oral arguments, and, and the panel comes out with a decision. And if countries don't like that, then it goes to an appeal mechanism, so the appellate body. Body. Um, and, and that ultimately provides the, the final stop, in which case a report is issued and countries uh, adopt it. Um, but this mechanism, this dispute settlement mechanism, became the most active part of the WTO. Um, so I think as of January, there are 600 cases that have been officially filed. Um, it creates an interesting soup of issues where countries stopped negotiating with one another but started litigating with each other. And so all of those issues that should have been solved by negotiations are now being kicked to the dispute settlement function. And so the U.S. for its part, um, after years of systemic concerns, finally put a stop to the appointment of appellate body judges um, over concerns about judicial overreach, a number of opinions where um, they, in, in the U.S. opinion, uh, the, the appellate body judges had taken rules that meant one thing and stretched them to mean something else. Uh, but fundamentally, it, it's the fact that there is not uh, the ability to negotiate new rules that is really causing stress on the system and has led to a number of actions that go outside the system, the proliferation of free trade agreements, of regional trade agreements to try to get at the China issues, the subsidy issues, some of the more modern trade challenges. So that that's in a, a nutshell um, where the WTO stands. But um, it, 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 to my mind, it, it really is just stuck in, in the last era. No, that's that's very helpful, Bernard. What's your take on this? That it, you know, why? I assume you agree that it, it did not live up to the, to the hopes and dreams of, of at the end of the Uruguay round. What what do you see as the causes? I think there's a number of things. On the one hand, I think we need to kind of reflect on the fact that the GATT was only an agreement on trade in goods, right? And one of the big things that happened during the Uruguay round was that it was extended to cover trade and services. It was extended to cover intellectual property rights. So there was quite a big expansion in the coverage of the rules of the game, which really brought it more into the 20th century. Uh, because, you know, even at even in the 20th century, you know, we were already living in services economies that accounted for anywhere between 60, 70, 80 percent of GDP. So <clears throat> in that sense, the system became what was really greatly updated uh, during the Uruguay round negotiations. But at the same time, I think in parallel, one of the reasons why the system has gotten into trouble is that we have a number of large emerging economies who essentially have taken all the advice that they were given by the World Bank and the IMF during the 1980s and during the 1990s. They did a huge amount of domestic reform opened up their economies, started to participate in the global economy, and did really well, right? Certainly not all of them, but a lot of them did. And of course, the number one student here is China. 
Right, so I think one of the reasons we are where we are is because the power, let's say the economic power balance has really changed a lot in the last 25, 30 years. And of course, a lot of the focus is on China, but we also see India. India has been growing very consistently at anywhere between six, seven percent per year for decades. So we now have these emerging economies accounting for you know half of world GDP. Right. So the sense of the OECD countries is, OK, guys, this is great for you. It's also great for us because we like to have growing markets. We can sell to you. But, you know, we need a bit more reciprocity here. Right. So one of the presumptions that is built into the system is that developing countries get what is called special and differential treatment. Right. So that is one kind of source of, of the, the deadlock that exists because a lot of the larger countries don't really want to reciprocate to the degree that the EU, the US, other OECD countries would like to see them too. The other thing, and I think so, you know, Kellyanne said, you know, we, we kind of skip over the reasons, but I think the reasons are actually quite important. And one of the other reasons why things got stuck is because the WTO works by consensus. So the working practice is consensus, which means anybody can block anything, certainly when it comes to negotiations, and that has increasingly been abused. So it makes a lot of sense to have consensus if you're negotiating a deal which is going to actually put binding commitments on you. If you don't like that, then you should be able to say no, and therefore you have some negotiating leverage to say, okay, I don't really like this, you're going to have to give me something else, or we have to change. But consensus has become really abused by primarily these emerging economies, again, to basically say no to almost everything, including day-to-day -day business of the WTO. So in conjunction with the fact that it, it's very much a mercantilist negotiating forum where countries are always trying to link things together. So if you want to have something on agriculture, no, I want to have something on the ability for my engineers to move into your country and compete on that particular market. You know, that's the give and take, which was really the, the basis of the Uruguayan deal, which extended the GATS to cover services and intellectual property rights. That has really become much more difficult and another source of problems. So I think one of the challenges looking forward is to kind of move away from, and I think Phil said this in the beginning, the idea was we wouldn't have these large rounds of negotiations anymore following the Uruguayan, and we would really focus on issues. And that vision never really materialized in part because of, of the consensus of the working practices of the WTO. And I think that's really one of the challenges that confronts the members in terms of unlocking the organization to again deal with current issues. And of course, there's lots of current issues which the WTO has very little to say on, right? So just think about the digital transformation we're all going through, rules for the digital economy. You know, that's not something that, that is being done. I would like to end on a positive note on this one, though, in terms of the current state. I think it is important to, to recognize that the WTO has delivered in some areas, right? So there is a trade facilitation agreement now, which is really important from an economic point of view because it really tries to reduce red tape uh, at the border, uh, customs clearance, um, kind of trying to get countries to adopt good practices with respect to border management. We have an information technology agreement that was expanded, right? So again, getting rid of a whole bunch of tariffs on IT products, which, is, which was negotiated in the WTO during this period. And there is now some green shoots in the sense that many countries have decided enough is enough and we're gonna give up on consensus, right? So we're gonna start negotiating in groups. And there are four ongoing negotiations on different topics that are among subsets of WTO members. And I think that offers potential for actually revitalizing the organization if they can get to yes. And we can talk about how you get to yes. Yeah, so this is great. So this actually gives us a very nice segue to our, to our next topic. And, and the reason why we're taking this on right now, which is we just had a new director general um, who took office this month. And this is, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweila, I hope I did that justice, um, the seventh WTO Director General, uh, a term that runs uh, through 2025. She has a long career, uh, actually, I, I wrote that wrong. She had a long career as a development economist at the World Bank, not at the WTO. 
She also, at various points, was predominantly finance minister and then briefly foreign minister of her native Nigeria. So, Bernard, I'm going to come back to you on this. You, you talked about the interesting role that developing countries have played. She's not the first uh, director general from a developing country, although she is the first from Africa. Um, and the sort of difficulty of consensus and bringing people together. You worked at, at the GATT for, for a while. What is this job and how? what are her challenges in doing it? She's also the first she. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that's also an important uh, step. For, you know, it, took long, it took a long time coming, but I think that's one of the positive dimensions of her appointment. Um, I think in, in terms of the job of the DG, the D, it's, it's important to recognize the DG is not an executive. Uh, so the DG cannot tell any of the members what to do. Uh, and kind of the standard line with respect to the WTO is we are a member-driven organization, i.e. the members are in the driving seat, and the secretariat is there to serve as a secretary, to support the members in whatever the members want to do or task them to do. So the role of the DG is essentially to manage the secretariats, right, to, to provide those secretarial functions, uh, which, of course, are defined in, in cooperation and in, in uh, consultation with the membership, right? So the membership asks the secretariat to do X, Y, Z. So one of those is, of course, dispute settlement. One of them is to serve uh, and support the negotiations. Another one of them is to help uh, assure that there's transparency in policy. So the Secretariat writes these trade policy review reports on countries uh, every other year or every four years, depending on how large the country is. So that's essentially what the DG does. So that's a big part of, of the DG job. It's to manage the secretariat, but the other part of, of the DG job is to actually uh, function as, let's say, the voice of the multilateral trading system and to push for multilateral cooperation in, in, in the trade in the trade area. And that also includes insofar as negotiations get lost and get, get launched, is to kind of help identify where there might be ways or where there might be scope for analysis, for information, for helping members get, get to yes. But, but her job is very much to be a neutral party, right? She doesn't have a, an ax in any particular policy kind of uh, angle, whatever. She's there really to support the membership. And I think there's, I just wanted to kind of mention a survey we did uh, last year when they were thinking about who should be the next director general, where we did a survey of around a thousand people who are in the trade business. So uh, trade officials, uh, delegations in Geneva, uh, officials in capitals, business, um, uh, and so forth, parliamentarians, what have you, but people who really work on trade. So this is kind of an, in, an inside crowd, an expert, an expert survey. And we asked them, what kind of characteristics should the DG have? And what is really striking to me is that uh, Ngozi essentially fits the bill, right? So there was a pretty large majority of, of respondents who said, we need somebody who actually knows and understands development, economic development. We need somebody who has been in a political position, who has actually been in a ministry and run a ministry. Um, sorry about this. Uh, there you go. That's how you know he's actually in Europe. It's a very European oh, ring. Oh, man. Yeah. Welcome back. Okay. Sorry about this. I've, hang, I've hit hang up 10 times, and it just keeps on ringing. Okay. No worries. So... So there's this, this, this um, really tension in terms of, do you want someone who is, uh, who, anyone who has access in capitals, who can pick up the phone and talk to the minister, who can pick up the phone and talk to the prime minister of countries, as opposed to someone who is more of a technical bureaucrat, someone who really knows the trade weeds and can really help provide this support to members in Geneva when they go about their business. And uh, as I mentioned in the survey, there was a very clear sense we need someone 
who is not necessarily in the trade weeds because her predecessor is somebody who was a trade ambassador who had been in Geneva for a long time, who knows the place inside out. And clearly that didn't work, right? So the choice was, we need somebody else. And I think Ngozi fits that bill very well. And I think one of the reasons she's, I suspect why a lot of countries were behind her is a sense of, we need someone who can connect to other international organizations and who can help deal with some of these problems that are associated with developing countries and this special and differential treatment problem that I mentioned uh, earlier. Because, you know, I, so I'm an economist, um, as is Phil, and one of the things we know is that if you are focused on thinking about how can trade actually help development, a large part of the problem has nothing necessarily to do with trade policy. It's really about building domestic capacity. It's about building domestic institutions, et cetera. So another one of the things that the WTO did, which is actually positive, which I didn't mention in the last round, is they set up something called aid for trade. And essentially the idea is, is that donor countries can actually help developing countries put in place and strengthen institutions they need to actually trade. Right? And customs, for example, is a good example. So the whole trade facilitation agenda in terms of helping improve trade facilitation is an example of that aid for trade mechanism. And I think I would speculate that a, a pretty large number of countries, especially OECD countries, were thinking, if we bring in somebody like Ngozi, she has those connections, and therefore maybe we can change the debate a bit away from we need special and differential treatment or we need to be exempted to a discussion which is much more, okay, what is the problem? How can we actually help you improve capacity? And that, of course, is something the WTO cannot do. They have no money. They have no capacity themselves. But if you bring in somebody who actually has connections to the World Bank, who has connections to the African Development Bank, who has connections to the people who actually do have that type of money and technical expertise, maybe we can relax some of the constraints for the developing countries that are not in the category of China and India, but you know the large mass of, of African countries, countries in Central Asia, and so forth. Let me stop there. No, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Kellyanne, you gave us a list of concerns. Um, how optimistic are you that Dr. Okonjo Iwela can, can meet those concerns, can do the kind of things that Bernard was just talking about, and maybe set the, the WTO going in a more uh, promising direction? Or, I mean, there, there is a phenomenon among organizations that is known as the glass cliff. And that is the phenomenon whereby women are not given leadership roles until an organization, whether it's a, a company or a corporation or, or something else, are, are in their dying days and they're in the brink of failure. And I, 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 I have a lot of sympathy for her in the position that she's in right now because the WTO is in serious trouble. And so not only is her success going to be judged vis-a-vis -vis her predecessors, but her job is going to be harder because the WTO is further entrenched down this line line of irrelevancy and, and being able to pull it out from the brink is more and more difficult. And, and part of the reason for that is what Bernard started with, and, and that is um, the fact that it is a member-driven organization at its core. And so while who is at the head is important in terms of signaling, um, in terms of their ability to reach into capitals, uh, have their phone calls returned, to be able to think creatively, ultimately her fate is going to be in the hands of the WTO membership in the direction that they see the organization going. Um, but I, I do think that she has some soft power. And, you know, having worked with a, a number of DGs, you know, while formally they need to remain neutral, and I think that is their power, uh, is the fact that they are perceived by every country as a, a neutral arbiter and not in the pocket of any other government. Behind the scenes, they do exercise some uh, some authority in terms of being able to push members, even if it just softly, in certain directions and to steer the agenda. So I think that you know I, there are a number of ways that the WTO could attempt to move forward. I'm not particularly optimistic about any one of them, uh, but I do think that the most important thing she could do is to try to expand the agenda of the WTO 
The GATT in the late 70s faced the same crisis of irrelevancy. Uh, John Jackson, who's a famous international trade academic, wrote that the GATT was on the verge of irrelevancy in 1978. The antidote was in the 80s, expanding the Uruguay Round agenda to include some of these non-trade and good um, agenda items like intellectual property services and the like. And I think that we're at that crisis point now where she's going to have to be creative about expanding the agenda to include some modern trade issues that members are really interested in right now. Because right now, countries just aren't using the WTO for anything pressing or important because it takes 10 years to go through negotiations that don't seem to go anywhere anyway. Um, so all of that to say, I think that she um, you know, certainly can inject some new lifeblood and enthusiasm, and she has the wind behind her and, and a lot of um, confidence from uh, WTO members, but uh, she really is between a rock and a hard place. No, that's that's useful. And I want to come back to that idea about where might negotiations go, how we expand an agenda. Before we do that, though, I want to come, we've got all kinds of interesting things to talk about. I want to delve for a moment into what has been the most salient dispute recently, which is dispute about disputes, about the appellate body, about the dispute settlement system. And so I'm going to try something a little bit ambitious. And audience, this is where we're calling on you again. So I'm giving you a story problem. Um, and so we'll see how this works, because I want to sort of see if we can use this to frame what some of this argument is about. So here's your story. Suppose we have two countries who are having a fight over internet gambling. This is based on real world events. And they take this fight to the WTO. One wants to disallow internet gambling. The other thinks that they should have the right to do to provide internet gambling services. Everybody looks and checks what do the existing agreements talk about. As you saw earlier, the existing agreements are old. They don't talk explicitly about internet gambling. They do, however, talk about, in general terms, things like trade and services and whether you have morals exceptions to the rules. All right, so that's the dilemma. And this is where we're gonna ask your view. You all get to be appellate judges here for a moment. Which best represents your view on how this dispute should be decided? So first possibility, if internet gambling isn't covered by the WTO, the WTO has no business ruling on the matter. Second possibility, it's fine for the WTO to decide on internet gambling. No set of rules is complete. An independent panel of WTO experts should apply their best judgment to how old rules would apply to these new scenarios and you resolve the dispute. Um, Third possibility is we'd just be better off without multinational bodies passing judgment. Countries should do what they like and then work out the consequences between them. So who, who needs any dispute settlement mechanism? Fourth possibility, do I look like a lawyer? So we, we wanna make sure that we span all of the, the, the possibilities here. So essentially to recap, the first one is very narrow view of this. If, if that particular issue isn't covered, just stay out and say we have nothing to say. Second, a much more expansive view, which is you're always going to have to adapt rules to cover unanticipated things. The third, I don't like dispute settlement systems. Fourth, I'm going to sit and listen to what you say next. So um, again, no wrong answers. Thank you for playing along. Um, if we can get some more votes here, we will then turn to our experts and see what their take is on something like this. We've got a bunch of you who have voted. I very much appreciate that. Um, so here's your last chance. Get in. No penalties for you either way. Going once, going twice. Survey says. Ah, we've got a, a fairly expansive group, which is we've got 53% saying it's fine to go ahead and decide on internet gambling. You don't have the complete set of rules. You take the principles and you extend them as best you can. Then we have. Um, a if you, the first version is the narrow that got twenty one percent nineteen percent on the better not to have these um, at all so Kellyanne let me throw this back to you as our as our resident lawyer on all of this um, first is that a fair characterization of what some of the disagreement is with the appellate body and maybe you could also talk us through just where this is, what is the difference between panels and appellate body and, and how we hit this impasse. You mentioned it earlier. Sure. It's um, well, this is a very interesting question. I, I feel sorry I can't um, vote for number four uh, since I am a lawyer on these issues. <laughs> 
Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very complicated, but let me start with a, a quick overview of the dispute settlement mechanism. Um, so, so we're talking about, and then I'll, I'll go back to your question about uh, which one of these categories is most relevant. So um, the WTO has a, a dispute settlement mechanism, which I mentioned in my first response. It's, it has a few different component steps in it. So the first step is countries get together and uh, file a request for consultations, which means they get in a room and they talk about the problem and, and they try and work through it and see if they can resolve it on a political level. Um, that is successful about 50% of the time. So 50% of the time disputes stop at consultations. The other 50% of the time they move on to what's called a panel request. And that is this panel of experts. You have three experts which the parties agree to or the director general um, will appoint in the case they can't agree. And uh, it, it is like any other court proceeding where the, the two parties uh, file written submissions, they have an oral hearing, and then the three panelists get together, working with the secretariat, come up with a report which they present to the parties. Um, the, the parties can either adopt that report uh, or they can challenge it with the appeal mechanism. And, and that's the appellate body uh, is what it's called under the WTO system. The appellate body is what's currently not functioning uh, because the US has refused to appoint new appellate body members. Uh, but prior to that, um, there was a possibility to be heard by three appellate body members, which would um, uh, present their views on um, the report. And then that report would have to be adopted. Um, so that, that's the dispute settlement function in, in a nutshell. Uh, the, in terms of the, the basket that um, uh, the basket of issues that were presented on the survey, you know, my own view is somewhere between the first one, second one, and third one. Um, as a negotiator and a litigator, I've sat on both sides of this. Um, it is impossible as a negotiator to future proof an agreement. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, let's say you're negotiating an intellectual property agreement. You're trying to come up with new rules that uh, govern um, all sorts of different commercial activity. You are not going to draft a 10,000 page agreement. You are going to come up with, you know, 30 to 40 pages or, or 80 pages of text that set out some general principles, some of which are more concrete than others, some of which are more aspirational than others, some of which are more binding than others. Um, and, and that is going to be the text that forms the new set of rules. So when uh, I have a dispute with Phil, I'm not going to be able to point specifically to a provision on internet gambling in that uh, agreement and say, aha, this means you can do it, this means you can't. Um, there's going to be some interpretation back and forth of that rule to try to see, does that behavior, is that behavior captured by the rules as drafted? And where we can't agree, we take it to a panel or an appellate body to try to come up with the right interpretation. Um, but the other side of that is there are some cases which clearly aren't contemplated by the rules. And let's say that I have an interest in stopping Phil from doing his internet gambling um, business because it's hurting you know, my local workers and, and producers and, and I don't want him to do it anymore. I have an incentive to challenge him, even if I know, or let's say I don't know, whether that activity is covered, I might tell Phil that it is and we may have a dispute about it and a panel or a pellet body may find that that activity is covered. And now if you talk to the original negotiators and they go back and say, wait, 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 we actually talked about that issue in the negotiating room and decided not to cover it. But yet a judge, an international judge or panelist has decided that it's covered. That is called judicial activism. And that is where the judges are filling the place where negotiators either intentionally decided not to create rules, so to let countries do what they wanted, or if it was ambiguous, maybe Phil thought we came to an agreement, I didn't, they're filling the gap. Uh, and so in those instances, um, it's viewed uh, uh, from a member state country as, as an egregious breach of um, what was meant to be the four corners of this deal. And that's when you get into issues of sovereignty infringement, is if I, as a member country, decided that I didn't want that activity covered, it may be because my legislature is active on it, or I have some other national interests or, you know, what be that I didn't want that activity covered. But now, years later, an international court has said that it is. And so um, that, that's effectively the tension that's going on when we talk about this concept of judicial overreach. So it's not a clear cut issue. I, I think reasonable minds can disagree on a number of, of these issues. Uh, but in some places, it's, it's been pretty clear, especially when you go back and talk to some of the original negotiators of these provisions. So, Kelly, let me let me follow up with you before I turn to Bernard on this. 
you had a situation where you had the U.S. sharply criticizing the way the ballot body functioned, and then you had a number of other countries, including the European Union, saying, "Yes, yes, we want reform." Also, is were they objected to the same things, different things? Is there a possibility for reform? Is it clear even what reform the U.S. wants in this? Yeah, you know there there are a number of um, there are a number of issues with the appellate body that the United States has identified over the last twenty years, and I say twenty years because uh, the WTO launched a review of the whole dispute settlement mechanism in two thousand one called the dispute. Uh, settlement understanding review, DSU review. And I was one of the, the U.S. negotiators during those negotiations where we were arguing back and forth, tabling text, trying to meet bilaterally, plurilaterally with members and come up with new rules or guidance surrounding the dispute settlement mechanism so it would operate better. And so our concerns fell into a number of categories. Some were substantive um, in terms of judicial overreach, which is the, um, the scenario I just outlined, but some of them were more procedural. So one in particular was this 90-day rule, where in the text of the dispute settlement understanding, which are, are the, the rules of civil procedure for these WTO disputes, that the um, arbitrators need to follow. Um, one rule says, in no case shall uh, the, the appellate body um, review exceed 90 days. And the appellate body was constantly going over the 90-day threshold. The cases were too large. Members were bringing too many claims. Uh, understandable why they would want to, but there was a real question as to whether it was legal for them to do so without the permission of the parties. And so that's what I mean by a procedural issue. Um, so there were a number of procedural issues, a number of substantive issues. They were uh, discussed back and forth over the course of um, the, the over 15 years of negotiation in the DSU review. And we simply weren't able to tease out a, a way forward. Some countries were proposing remand as the way to solve this. Some countries were proposing greater third party rights. Some countries were um, proposing guidance to adjudicators, and our positions just became more and more and more entrenched. But at least from the U.S. perspective, I think the nail in the coffin was really some egregious examples of judicial overreach, where the U.S. felt that the bargain we struck in 1995 just wasn't the same bargain anymore, and, and that where um, negotiators had stopped sitting together and meeting together at the negotiating table, the judges were taking over and, and there just didn't seem to be hope. But from the European perspective, and I'd be, I'd be interested in, in Bernard's take as well, um, there seems to be more comfort with having uh, international judges opining on international rules in a way that is less comfortable from a U.S. tradition. Um, and part of it is, you know, the, the difference between civil law and, and common law traditions. Part of it is the concept of having a European court of justice, whereas the U.S., um, you know, we, we sort of are allergic to a lot of international courts more broadly. We see it as a sovereignty issue. Um, there are some value and cultural issues that I think make it difficult for us to bridge the gap as well. But I, I do think we, when we talk about reform, sometimes we're talking about the same things, but sometimes we're talking about different things. Okay, that's helpful. Bernard, let me toss it to you. What, how well do you think the system functions? You've done a bunch of research on, on, on dispute settlement stuff. Is it a cultural difference um, and, and just a different approach, civil law, um, common law? What, what is your take? I, no, I think there is there is a difference in kind of comfort level, as Kellyanne was saying, between the EU and in particular the US in terms of having a court kind of fill the gaps, right? The way you, you set it out in, in, in your case study. But at the same time, I think the EU was on the same page as the US in terms of kind of recognizing that the WTO is not a supranational institution. It's intergovernmental and the appellate body has some clear rules that constrain what it is supposed to do and which lay out what it is supposed to do. And I think there was, you know, one of the things that happened as a result of the US essentially killing off the appellate body uh, during the Trump administration was that there was a really active, for the first time, I think, you know, an active discussion as to, okay, so what do we want as WTO membership? And again, it's, it's a member-driven organization. And it's very clear that the majority is very much in favor of having an appeals function, right? That was clear. Um, at the same time, it's also pretty clear that there are problems and, and things that need to be fixed. 
right? So, and it, and it's obvious that you expect after 25 years, you know, there are things that you learn and things that need to be improved. And as Kellyanne mentioned, there has been a dispute settlement understanding review process ongoing now for many years, where many suggestions were put forward for improvements, right, including on some of these issues that, that blew up in the last couple of years, and which were never adopted, again, because of the working practices of the WTO consensus, right? So there's always good, there were always one or two countries that said no, or who said, well, if we go along with this, we have to have something else, right? So it's part and parcel of, of why the, the organization was in trouble. But I think the, 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 the key points I would make on, on dispute settlement is if you don't have any function, if you don't have a functioning dispute settlement system, you're never going to get an agreement, right? Why would you negotiate if you can't enforce, right? And if you don't have functioning dispute settlement, you can't enforce. So everything breaks down. So one, one key point here is that if we want to maintain a multilateral trading system that is based on negotiated rules, you need to have a, an operational dispute settlement system. So I think for the next DG, for, well, for Negozi right now, one of the key things is, of course, is to get that fixed. Right, and there was a process in the in, in 2019-20 where the members actually thought about, okay, so what do we do with these U.S. concerns? How do we address them? And I think they came pretty far in terms of recognizing that, yes, these are legitimate concerns, and two, we don't really have a big problem in addressing them. Right, so I think where the real issue is, in my mind, is not so much... Um, putting all of the burden on the appellate body and whether or not we like that judges may or may not engage in gap filling because the membership, if it wants, can just say explicitly, no gap filling, simply not acceptable, right? And in principle, that's really what they, 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 they can't go down the gap filling route very far anyway because it wouldn't be uh, legitimate. But I think what needs to be done, obviously, is insofar as you have these cases like you put forward on, on the internet gambling, if there aren't any rules... And members think this is important, right? It, it's creating problems in terms of trade. Well, negotiate some rules, right? That's what the organization is there to do. So I think that's the that has to be part of the problem of the solution to the problem. Um, so so clarity in terms of where, where you draw the boundaries, and let's release some of the constraints on negotiating these new rules, which clearly are needed. Yeah, so that's a great segue to our, our last sort of focus point, which is, and, and I strongly agree, you know, however one feels about gap filling, the longer you go without having negotiations, the bigger those gaps get to be, and, and the more the worse the problem. You can address this by negotiation. So we're going to do our last poll, ask people to weigh in. Let's think about negotiations. Let's think about what the WTO could be doing. So this is your wish list poll. Um, the most pressing issue for the WTO to deal with right now is, and here are your choices, and we're going to ask you to pick one of these, lowering tariffs of all sorts, including national security, safeguards, etc. Alternatively, non-tariff barriers to trade, by which we mean quotas, rules, regulations, and so forth. Third possibility is subsidies in state-owned enterprises, where the role that governments are playing in trade. Another possibility is environmental measures and trade. I'm adding in here harmonizing rules across different regional agreements. We haven't had time to delve too much into it, but one of the things that's happened is as the WTO has stalled in its negotiations, you've had active negotiations elsewhere, sometimes meaning different rules that people who trade have to deal with. Um, a last is one that we've touched on a little bit, the rights and responsibilities of developing countries. So uh, I meant this in part to sort of show the rich set of possibilities, but let me ask you all to sort of pick if you were going to say a point of emphasis to, you know, advise the new director general, what would you like to see the WTO most focus on? And then we'll talk a little bit for our closing discussion about whether or not, you know, how important breadth is and what they, what our, uh, our guests think should be the point of emphasis. All right, we're getting some votes in. Thank you. If you, if you are so inclined, please pick one of these most pressing issue for the WTO to deal with right now. I'll give a moment or two more, and then we'll see what you said. Thank you for those who have voted. All right, let's see what we've got. Um, most pressing issues. <clears throat> Interesting. So actually the number one comes in as 
harmonizing rules across all the different regional agreements, um, followed by, oh, I'm sorry, that's slightly behind non-tariff barriers to trade. I'm, I'm reviewing this too quickly. Then with, uh, uh, for wind place and show, in third place, we have lowering tariffs of all sorts. So we've got just a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to open this up, um, and Kellyanne, perhaps you can go first. You talked about expanding the agenda. What did you mean by that, and what do you think are the prospects for this? Sure, I, and um, I, just to, to note quickly on the poll, I think that's very interesting, particularly from a commercial perspective, right? Like having to navigate so many different free trade agreement rules almost undermines the whole purpose of having a single multilateral trading system in the first place. So I, I completely understand um, uh, this result here. You know, what I meant by expanding the agenda is that, and Bernard talked about this too, right now the only negotiating action happening at the WTO are a couple of different plurilateral agreements that are happening in silos, meaning there's a certain amount of countries who are interested in negotiating on fish subsidies. There's another set of countries that are uh, negotiating on e-commerce. And these negotiations seem to have no end. Um, fish subsidies, for instance, has, has been ongoing for 15 years um, with limited prospects of an outcome anytime soon. Um, but I would expand the agenda to include anything that would get anyone interested in negotiating at the WTO again. So, so modern trade issues, whether that's you know, climate, women's economic empowerment, subsidies, disciplines on state-owned enterprises, anything that, that sort of fits in this modern challenge category. But then I would also say that it needs to be a broader set of issues. Because if you're just negotiating with a, a set of countries on, on a single set of issues, it is very challenging to make those trade-offs that are necessary to close the deal. So to my mind, there needs to be you know, a subset of countries who are interested in serious negotiations with several different topics on the table, different negotiating rooms happening so that those trade-offs can be made and can be made successfully. Um, but if we continue to do it uh, just with subsets of, of countries in single issues, we're, we're not going to make progress. That's been tried before, and, and unfortunately, it's failed. So, Kelly, let me quickly, before I go to Bernard on this, I'm very, very sympathetic to that argument. You need to allow for these trade-offs. One of the criticisms before was these rounds were getting incredibly complex, and you'd have this nothing is agreed till everything is agreed. How do you pull it all together? And the more issues, the tougher that was. Do you worry about complexity? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you look at the proliferation of FTAs and regional trade agreements who are also covering the waterfront of issues, and those managed to close you know, just fine in a lot of cases. So, I mean, really, the problem is there are 164 countries and it requires consensus. So I think at some point you need to decide if you want to move this organization further, it has to be a subset of countries who are serious about those particular issues and driving the agenda further. And, and others are just going to have to catch up when they can. And, and that's not a, a pleasant message. It's not something that is very WTO-ish in terms of we're all in this together on an equal playing field, but it really is the truth. So I would recommend doing it on a plurilateral basis, um, having a broader set of issues, and I think that that would alleviate some of those um, issues. So thank you. Bernard, you had mentioned earlier that these plurilaterals were taking place. Do you agree that that's the way forward? And, and what do you think about sort of the scope that they should be addressing? Well, I think they should be addressing a lot more. So I think that is clearly the way forward. I think it's the only way you get around the consensus constraint. I think the big challenge is going to be uh, how do you deal with <coughs> situations where some of the large countries that should be part of an agreement and where there are free writing concerns, how do you ensure that you can actually move ahead uh, among the like-minded set? Right, so that I think that is, if we think about challenges for the DG and for the membership, I think that is the number one kind of challenge in terms of keeping the WTO relevant because you have to be able to negotiate these types of plurilateral agreements and implement and enforce them. And they're very well, especially when we start talking about rules, about regulations, there is going to be conditionality, right? So there's no way you can apply an agreement on regulatory policies on an MFN basis because country X is going to have to have the minimum regulatory standards in place for the other countries to allow that country to participate in an agreement. So this this is a this is a challenge. But I, I, I think there's a lot and I was it's interesting that the, the poll showed kind of trying to 
reduce the costs associated with the heterogeneity of rules in different trade agreements. That, of course, is exactly what the WTO is there to do. Right? And I think there's a huge amount that can be learned from all of the effort and experience that has been now collected over the last 20 plus years in different regional arrangements and say, okay, what can we bring to the WTO? What can we actually multilateralize? And I think a lot of these innovations that you find in trade agreements can be extended to other countries. And I think here, one of the, the, one of the, the things that really strikes me in terms of the trade policy landscape that we've seen in the last couple of years is what some countries in the Asia Pacific are doing with respect to negotiating digital economy agreements, right? And they build on, on, on traditional trade agreements, but they really get into the digital arena. And one of those is actually designed to be explicitly modular, right? So you can take those modules and you say, anybody can join that particular module. You don't need to sign on to the whole thing, right? So we're actually seeing now a trend towards plurilateralism at the regional level. Right, which again should facilitate bringing that back to the multilateral level uh, in Geneva. And, and I think there's a huge amount that actually could be done. So if you relax this consensus constraint, which has now been relaxed, I think there's a huge amount you can do. But you need to focus on things that actually matter to business, right? Because otherwise there's little point in doing that. So I think it's really more incumbent on the business community to identify areas in which you can say, listen, the, the heterogeneity we see across trade agreements in, for example, take rules of origin, very practical, very technical, very important. Let's put together a plurilateral type of approach where we say, okay, a lot of what we actually find in these agreements, they're basically doing the same thing in terms of determining where a good originates, except they're worded differently, there's different compliance procedures. Why don't we just accept to recognize what we do in different agreements, right? So we, we, we establish equivalence of rules of origin. Right now, that's a really, I think, significant trade facilitation type of initiative, which has to be done on a plurilateral basis, and which clearly does not have to involve everybody in the WTO. So again, I think it's just an illustration of, of a lot that could be done through the plurilateral track. And I think that is going to be, you know, the way we move forward if if we move forward. All right. Right up until that if at the end, uh, that was starting to sound kind of optimistic. Which, but I'll take I'll take the, I'll take the moderated optimism there. And we we have not run out of interesting things to talk about, but we have run out of time. So let me thank both of you, Kellyanne and Bernard, for for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, a, a very interesting overview of where we stand as we launch a new director generalship of of the of the WTO. To our audience, thank you for joining us. An on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after we conclude. You can use the audience link that was sent to you earlier. Please remember to save your spot for the next uh, linguist, uh, next uh, Logistics Rewired webinar and for our State of Trade webinar series. Thank you again, and please stay safe.